Welcome to From Embers to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. It isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today's guest is Michael Yetter, a great friend, a captain with Miami-Dade Fire Rescue, and a veteran of the United States Army and Army National Guard. Mike began his career in the fire service with Miami-Dade in 1998. He worked his way up the ranks, becoming a very well-respected fire officer and paramedic. He has served in some of the busiest stations Dade County has to offer. He has served in leadership positions and been deployed in various capacities on Miami-Dade's USAR team, Florida Task Force One, which is a state and federal asset. He currently serves his department as the officer in charge of recruit training. Additionally, he has been one of my mentors, helping me grow as a leader. And I know for a fact that he has the respect and admiration of so many in the fire service. He is a true leader in every sense of the word. Mike, I read a short blog post you did on the Hook and Irons website a couple years ago. It talks about something I've heard you talk about since we first began discussing aspects of leadership. It is titled The Damn Few. Can we start with that? Its origins and maybe what it means to you and the people you have instilled with that credo. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, Thank you for the uh, the recap of the uh, of my uh, my uh, career so far, which it's uh, is gone by quick. Uh, so, um, you know, as they say, it's not a cliche. It, uh, it does. The last twenty plus years have gone by the blink of an eye. Um, the, the the damn few, uh, of course, it was it was the book that was written by uh, um, Warwick Denver. Um, Navy SEAL. It was the movie uh, Act of Valor, which was based on um, on a, many of the uh, SEAL team's uh, exploits. Um, and um, from the movie, there's they do have a saying uh, or a, te- uh, a toast. We're on the beach, and they talk about um, you know to those uh, downrange, those before us, um, and those like us, the damn few. And that was just something that really struck a chord because it was. Um, I guess it resonated with me and I, I could identify with that in any organization uh, that you have, there's um, you have, you know, the, the 20 or so percent that are the it's mentioned in the, the blog or the bottom feeders, you have the 60% that are the status quo. And then you have the, the 20% give or take a couple percentage points that are the damn few. And, um, I think where, for for me personally, I, I derive a lot of inspiration from that, and it almost serves as a um, as a point of inspiration in others, especially when I um, when I I try to seek out to be surrounded by those individuals. Uh, I consider myself a status quo, but but readily um, uh, receptive to those. Um, those types of individuals that are that just operate at a higher plane on any given day or not on any given day on every day they give 110 percent 100 percent of the time and um they're they're really the ones that that inspire me um and i think that there's you know if i'm lucky enough to be considered one of those uh it's it's one of those uh, circles you know where I'm deriving inspiration from them while they're trying to find that, or they derive that inspiration from me, whether by me mimicking their behavior um, or, or me acknowledging it. And then there's always the, those that are in the periphery that, um, that look at and say, I, I want to be a part of that. You know, I, I like having that. Um, so on the fire service, you know, you, you want to be that the go-to guy, either as a fireman, you want to be the go-to person as a, your officer, as an officer, you want to be the go-to uh, person for your chief, and uh, and and upwards up the chain of command. That's really um, that's really the inspiration for it. So over the years, we've 
discuss leadership extensively. And we're, we're really um, no different than many of, uh, many of the people that talk about leadership and how to make it better. There's, there's a philosophy. And um, just wanted to see if you would share a little bit about your personal leadership philosophy and, and maybe some of the people that have helped shape your philosophy on leadership? Um, I, I really, I think it, it, it comes down to, um, I know it didn't come coin the phrase, but I, I believe that um, Frank Viscuso who wrote Step Up and Lead, um, which was a fantastic book. And I found myself just nodding my head up and down with the way that he was able to collect a, a lot of the different leadership books that have been read articles or whatnot. And he just combined them into a, you know, into one freaking fantastic, you know, um, book of, of leadership. And he coined the phrase, well, I'm sorry, he didn't coin the phrase, but he talks about servant leadership. And, and I really think that that's what my style, um, or my, yeah, my style of leadership um, tries to embody, you know, my, my, my position as a leader is to, to carry the water for the team so they could go ahead and they could execute the tasks that need to be done. Um, and I, my personality, I like to be behind the scenes anyways, and I don't feel comfortable being at the forefront anyways, uh, unless I'm going to be taking a bullet for my guys so they can go ahead and they can execute the tasks that need to be, be done. And that's, I think, throughout my, my military and my fire department career, I've, I, don't, I've, I guess I've come across different officers, different firefighters, mostly firefighters um, that uh, Guys at the rank of firefighter that really, they're just, you know, they're the senior um, person in the house and they're the ones that just quietly make things happen. They lead by example and they, um, they're, they're so committed without being overzealous, without being preachy. They offer the words of wisdom. They provide the perspective. They, they provide the, um, um, uh, the proverbial why to the reasons why things need to be done. And, you know, I've been blessed to have worked with probably some of the best officers within Miami-Dade County um, who were also would go above and beyond and not just order a task, but order, be able to explain why that task was essential because this isn't a combat environment. Not, so they were able to build up trust. They built up the confidence to where in the non-emergency situations through the training because a lot of the officers that I work with were so diligent about training and explaining the whys things were important, why simple tasks matter, because if it's important, if you can t be trusted to execute the small tasks, then you'll be trusted to execute the bigger tasks when the time comes. And I think that builds that level of trust, you know, through their consistency, which is a is a big factor. You know, you want to know who you're coming to work with every day, and are those standards going to be the same every day? And then once they are, you know what you're dealing with, and then you have that pattern of consistency. And that's something that that I've always strived to, you know, to, to emulate and to duplicate. So, what what has inspired you most as a fire officer? Um, uh, really my, uh, my firefighters and then, um, uh, and the fire officers that I work with, uh, uh, the lieutenants in particular, uh, where I work in recruit training, um, I see their, their commitment to excellence, uh, their, their passion that I mean, it's inspiring to to watch and in, through the conditions that would that they're that they're doing it in uh day in and day out and then on the weekends when nobody's supposed to be watching they're they're out there 
you know, I mean, it's just the most recent example, but um, going back through my career, it's, um, you know, you have the third or fourth call after midnight and your level of care is maybe not where it should be. But if it's after a job, you know, when they're fired, those are the guys that are wiping down the tools, you know, and even if it's another hour or two before shift change, they're still making it a point to wipe everything down and make everything perfect for the crew that's coming on. And, um, and it's beyond and they have to do it, you know, because it's a matter of personal pride for them. Right. And that's, that's really where it's like, it's a reality check. And as an officer, you know, I can't maybe necessarily order them to do that because it's that, that pride is, is from within, you know, so it's really, uh, my crews have always knew where I stood and, and, and where I, if it looks neat, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna play out neat, whether it's the hose, um, you know, the hose in the hose bed or the tools to me, it's a homage to the fire gods. You've been in multiple positions throughout your career. Um, and I know you've studied and promoted and moved from one uh, area of the county to another, probably worked with men and women that you never worked with before. I mean, Miami-Dade Fire Rescue is huge. I don't know how many uh, frontline personnel you have, but it's upwards of 1,800, correct? It's over 2,500, I think, as of last count. All right, well, there you go. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's so, uh, so my question is, is that when you move into a new position and you're leading people that don't necessarily know you and you don't know them. Um, and, and I'm hoping that our discussions will benefit other people that listen to this. You know, describe your process for leading people when, when you're new to that group. Um, it's actually, it's a good question. And, and during our department's uh, officer development program, you know, where I've, I've been fortunate enough to teach leadership uh, a couple of times um, that that comes up and and usually if, if I could if I play out my presentation right I uh, I get to, to this very point before the first question is asked but inevitably new officers they're hungry and they, they um, they're not looking so much for guidance on on tactics and what to do and how do you position your, your apparatus or what would you do in this you know, hypothetical scenario? Almost every single one is concerned about the, the, the interaction with the personnel. And, and really what I found is, is that um, it, it seems like an obvious thing, but it's not obvious until it's stated out loud and definitely until it's, it's actually executed. This is starting off with that morning briefing and having a, uh, you know, going over the expectations with the crew and, um, and being as a newly promoted lieutenant or a new, um, a new captain rolling in somewhere. What I like to do is, is I'll take my crew first thing in the morning as we're checking out the truck. Um, and I'm right there checking out the truck with them as if I was a probie. It's a, it's a new apparatus. I need to know where everything's at as well. And, um, and I go over you know, the things that, um, like over the plan of the day, you know, I don't like to man micromanage and I tell them that I won't micromanage. Although the caveat that I have is the size and complexity of the scene based on the experience I have on the truck, um, will dictate how much I micromanage, you know, somebody. So if I have a crew that I have more years or I have more years than the other three do, you know, cumulatively, I'm going to probably have a little bit tighter leash, but what I'll do is, is that I'll just go over the expectations. This is how I expect things to, to play out. These are going to be your positions. If we roll up on a fire, um, structure fire on a, uh, car fire, if it's uh, a trauma call with, uh, an entrapment, uh, through the, the medical call, you know, down to the, you know, if it's a trauma STEMI or stroke alert, you know, I, I go over my expectations because I can't assume otherwise until I tell them. And I even let them know, too. I'm going to sp spit out a lot of information. I'll repeat it, but I just don't want, you know, on the call or on the way to the call to be the first time that they hear it. 
And I found that that really works out well as a, as a captain, since I would be the st station OIC, I would even go so far as is use the, every you know, house in the county has a dry erase board. And I write the date and I write down the tasks, the to-do list for the day. So that goes from, you know, if it's Mondays, then I know that, you know, everybody knows that it's, you have to clean the stoves and the fridges. So stove fridge is there with a the little, you know, box next to it. I always put a training uh, or drill with a, with a question mark because, and I'll let them know that there's always teachable opportunities. So we may or may not, you know, find one and we're going to capitalize on it. So if we show up to an alarm ringing, you know, I may sit on that call a little bit if the territory isn't crazy and we're going to, we're going to go over and we're going to talk about how we would, you know, um, how we would attack a, a fire in this particular set of occupancy. How are we going to lay out the hose in the stairwell or the floor below? Um, and I just, uh, and then of course, if there's any uh, online continuing education units, if there's any memos that, uh, that are out that maybe they need to be aware of. And then finally at the end, I put dinner because to me, it's very important for everybody to have dinner as a family at the end, it's family time. Right. Um, and, and I let them know though, I'm not putting this on, on the board because I'm trying to be controlling. I just let them know that it's a, it's a reminder for, for them, but most importantly myself, because there are things that need to be done and we're tasked with doing them. So the captain shift always has to be, you know, cut above everybody else's. And for the most part, uh, actually, I got to say that uh, I've been very uh, fortunate or blessed that I've never had an issue with that. It, it's, I don't know if they say behind my back, but at least I'm always greeted with, okay, that, that makes sense. You know, and if it's eight o'clock at night and the stoves and fridge hasn't been clean, hey, it's on the board. Cause I know I'll forget. I'm so consumed with doing station orders, reports, and then whatever the case may be. It's, it, it's really a reminder for myself more than anything. Right. One thing, and I know personally, I've made a lot of mistakes throughout my career and in my personal life, I've learned a lot of valuable lessons. And, and it's not just me. I mean, we all, it's part of life. We all make mistakes. And um, if you spend enough time in the fire service, you're going to make some fire service related mistakes. And I think it's our job as you know, senior, senior people to pass along that knowledge, pass along those lessons. So in, in your career, what, what mistake or mistakes stand out as maybe some defining moments for you that you operate differently now because of those? I tell you what, it's, uh, I, I've made quite a few. I'd like to think that, um, you know, I'm, if, if I could get a, if there was a such thing as that PhD from hard knocks that, uh, that I'd be working on a triple or quadruple doctorate. Um, <laughs> um, it, it's it, seemingly looking back, just simple preventable headaches. Um, you know, as one of my uh, mentors would, would say it's, um, you know, where I've made, um, you know, I think the, the biggest, one of the biggest mistakes uh, that I've that I've made was um, being blinded um, by friendship and only seeing what I wanted to see, like seeing the the pros, you know, uh, of of my friend as a subordinate and kind of not paying attention to the cons, which were a lot, you know, um, in uh, in. in with that same person. The example being is, is I had a guy that I work with that this individual was my go-to um, for anything big. If it was a fire, if it was a trauma, it was a medical, that's the, this is the guy that you want responding to your family when it's real. The problem was is percentage wise, that wasn't a lot. Of, of our overall day or of our overall call volume. And the issue was, is that he was the type of guy that would be, you know, 
telling, standing with the dish towel in the kitchen, running his mouth, but not doing anything to help. But he'd be the first person to point out, hey, are you going to do something today? And it wasn't like he was the senior guy in the, in the house, you know, and and I had heard rumblings, guys approach me on the side, hey, you going to talk to your boy and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and for me, it was always, well, I got to find the right time. There just got to be, there'll be a catalyst where I'm going to bring it up when I would even acknowledge whether or not that complaint was legitimate. And it was. And as a result, this went on for, for a couple of years. And it wasn't until he, he bid to another shift that one, I felt that I had a less stress level on my shoulders all the time. And the other part was, is then I started really getting the truth of it. And then I was really able to, um, to detach as Jocko would say, um, where I was like, Oh, wow. I really dropped the ball. It was like, I, I, there was no doubt that my credibility as a leader was, was impacted by that, you know, which basically the message was, as long as you're the captain's boy, you could pretty much do whatever the hell that you wanted to do. And that is counterintuitive to being a strong leader who holds his personnel as well as themselves accountable. And that was like, that was a real bitter taste of humble pie that, um, you know, that, that I, that I had to, to eat, you know, and I still, when I look back or even telling about it, I cringe because it's like, of course, now I know better. Now I'd like to think that I'd have the fortitude to be able to, um, uh, to address those concerns in a more timely manner. Um, and then be consistent with, you know, Hey, you're dropping the ball, man. You're making us all look bad. Uh, but I, I can't go back, but I can learn from it. And of course, and I do share it um, because it doesn't do anybody any good for me to keep that a secret, you know, and pretend it doesn't exist when really there's a good sizable part of the population of the department that is aware of it. Right. So, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest ones that stand out. You know, um, if you have time, I have another one. Where, Absolutely. Yeah. It's um, all about learning. Yeah. It's, um, this was another word. Um, the very next crew I had from, from that one where I experienced that failure of friendship and I thought that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, the crew that I had, I got another senior guy um, that was, um, you know, top notch. I mean, we were, we had known each other for about, I don't know, three or four years worked well together. We became that, that, um, that, that cliche where anything big, it was all of our communication was nonverbal. We knew what had to be done without even saying it. Like we were in each other's heads the whole time. And we had a relatively junior guy, a junior medic that was on the, uh, on the, on the truck with us. Now, if anybody knows me, knows that I never really take anything that seriously, right? Because even when it's real serious, it's always a moment of brevity, you know, or levity and, 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 um, and just to try to not lighten up the mood to, to take away, but just be like, hey, we're good. You know, the story of Joe Montana, the, the huddle of the, uh, you know, game-winning drive against the Bengals years ago, you know, the, the game's on the line and he's like, Hey, look, there's John Candy in the end zone. And everybody, <laughs> even, you know, so I would try to interject something like that. And, um, and there'd be some times where you respond to thousands of medical calls. You could pretty much tell from the moment that you walk through the door, whether somebody's sick or not from the get go. Um, it doesn't replace doing a thorough assessment, but it, it, it affects the flow. And I responded to a lot of medical calls and a lot of, you know, um, a lot of calls that weren't life threatening. So there was a certain prevailing attitude that myself and my senior guy, you know, carried. And we noticed after a while that the new guy was having the same attitude. And I was like, the audacity, you, you're new, man. You're not one of us yet. You, you know, it's, you need to, to slow your road and, and, and just, you know, you need to learn something. And we had this one call where it was just 
it was one of those calls in 15 years of being a paramedic. Uh, we were both, we just looked at each other, uh, me and the senior guy, and we we're like, we don't know what's going on, but we need to go right now because this kid is messed up, you know? So we're, we're moving. And the junior guy's like, you know, kind of cutting up and, and, and making jokes with the family. We're like, hey, dude, we need to go, you know? We're going to talk, but let's go. So go ahead. We take the call, talk to him, and he just, he's not really getting it, you know? So a few hours later, it's like 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, me and my senior guy, we're talking, and it dawns on me, you know, because we're like, what's, what's this kid's problem? And it dawned on me. It was like, we're the problem. You know, we're the ones that are setting the example for him. He's trying to emulate us because he's young and impressionable. And because he, even though we know when to when it's real and when it's not, he doesn't. He doesn't have that switch yet. So we were directly responsible for that less than professional behavior, especially at a moment where we demanded the utmost of professionalism. And uh, again, another very bitter pill to swallow because it's like, you know, um, the, the uh, 80s, you know, where did you learn to do this stuff, kid? You know, I learned it from watching you. <laughs> that, that was us, you know. Right. Um, we have, as leaders, we have to be conscious of our example, you know, uh, that we set. Doesn't mean that we have to be laced up tight, but it does mean that we have to monitor our actions, you know, uh, judiciously. So how do you continue to learn in, in order to stay ahead of the curve uh, within your role? I read a lot, you know, uh, reading uh, Call Sign Chaos uh, by uh, General Mattis. You know, he says, if you haven't read hundreds of books, you're functionally illiterate. You know, I'm paraphrasing there, but uh, there's, I think that's, that hits the nail on the head, whether it's reading leadership books or it's reading NIOSH reports. You know, it's a, you read enough NIOSH reports, you start to figure out, man, there's a lot of reoccurring themes. Um, staying on top of the UL, um, you know, um, uh, the UL testing and a lot of the, uh, the work that's been going on with, uh, with that as far as the fire dynamics, you know, and then to find out that even though these are new advances, they're just pretty much validating what the Europeans have been doing for the last 20 or 30 years, which they were only now placing the science to what, uh, you know, uh, Chief Braidwood uh, had stated in the 1830s with the London Fire Brigade. So it's by recognizing that, I think it's a testament to just always, just always reading and staying involved and just being intrigued and stuff. And it's not about finding the latest gadget or, hey, this is how you do it. It's just ensuring that level of proficiency and comprehension of, of what's going on. Because at this point, there's really nothing new um, that's, that's out there. It's, it's, what's new is the understanding of how things work, the why you know, things are, um, or why fire behaves the way it does in a closed, you know, compartment. So to, to wrap things up, I've got one final question for you and, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. You've got two sons, Mikey and Matthew, Mikey being the oldest. If next year he came to you and said, Dad, I, I want to, I want to become a firefighter. You know, I'm going to take these steps. I've done all the research. How or what would you, what would you say to him? How would you help him prepare for the career ahead? Uh, just what are some things, uh, some lessons that you would want uh, to impart on him? Um, actually he has said that within the last year, um, you know, the running joke was, is we spent a small fortune in his private school education, you know, and I'm like, really, you want to be a firefighter, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, uh, has, uh, or, um, Edward Coker said, there's no, you know, more noble calling. Um, I, my advice to him, because he's 
not to me, but said to his, uh, to his grandmother, you know, was is that part of his reluctance and really pursuing it maybe from an earlier age was is that he didn't want to be, he was afraid to be in my shadow. Um, and I was like, there is no shadow, you know, you forge your own path. Um, the, the secret to this, to this job, you know, um, is, is really having initiative care. You know, I tell, I tell him, or I told him, like I would tell any of the recruits, you want to be a rock star, you know, you want to be a good firefighter on the department, or at least on Miami Dade, you know, it's uh, show up 15 minutes before, you know, your schedule, get on time and care, right? Just do your job. Um, and if you want to be a rock star, have initiative, show up 30 minutes beforehand and, and seek out tasks that need to be done before you're asked to do them. And I go, and if you just want to be over the top, you know, show up 45 minutes to an hour on time and, um, and have that initiative and, and never stop learning and being proactive with your questions, with your education, with your, with your training. The irony of me being where I'm at is, is that I wasn't a stellar student. I hated school. That's why I left for the army a week after graduation because I could stay in school. And since, what, since I finished minimum standards in 1996, it has been nonstop. Um, I guess the, what really like magnified that for me was is that um, Florida International University did a uh, visit to our um, to our training center, and they asked, uh, "Well, maybe we can get you what is it uh, lifestyle or life experience credits based on the things that you've done, the education, and uh, and the things that you've been a part of." And when I gave her two pages worth of education and work experience. Uh, between the multiple deployments, between all the different classes, the technical rescue, the paramedic, this, all the different things. She was like, are all of you guys like this? Because 15 uh, credit hours doesn't seem like it's fair. You know, and, and it was amazed, you know, and I was like, yeah, I guess, you, you know, it's um, so, but it's, uh, and I realized that that's not everybody's case, but it's, you know, it, I think it is a reflection of um, those that are in the same boat as maybe as my that have done a lot more. They always stay hungry. They they're never satisfied with um, with where they're at education wise because there's so much to learn that by the time you start to scratch the the surface, you know, it's like, well, what, what did I learn before? Captain Bill Gustin has been in the fire service, a legend in, you know, in Miami Dade Fire Rescue, editorial um, staff on fire engineering. He's been in the fire service for over 40 something years. And, uh, and, and he's still one of those inspirations. He's still learning. He'll be the first person to tell you. He goes, man, I don't know it all. And keep in mind, I mean, it's like you look at him, he's like, this guy knows it all. And right. it's, it's not just humility, it's, it's awareness. Right. So, so, and, and, that, and that is what I would tell my, my son, you know, have initiative, show up early and, uh, and never stop learning. Awesome. And thank you so much for, for coming on and talking with me. We've had these conversations. It's nice to actually be able to record it. So thanks, man. Thank you a lot. Of course. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence with Dave Hollenbach. Please visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. My goal is to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them. And the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.